Thank you so much, first of all, to the organizers, uh, Aaron and Lucina, for inviting me. This is my first SANS meeting. It's been awesome. Uh, thanks to you guys that are still here and not at the beach um, for this very last session. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, some really fresh preliminary, none of this is even close to being published yet, uh, so um, please, if you have any thoughts on it, uh, come find me afterwards. But basically, I'm going to give you a little overview of, of uh, how I've been thinking about the potential to predict behavioral phenotypes from brain activity during naturalistic viewing. Uh, so thinking about using naturalistic viewing or things like movies to study individual differences poses uh, some, some interesting questions and challenges. Uh, when we think about movies, we know from seminal work from Uri Hassan and other groups, uh, many groups now, that have shown that when we uh, show a bunch of different subjects the same rich, engaging stimulus, a lot of the brain ends up synchronizing across people. Uh, however, we also know uh, from some more recent work that there can still be some really interesting individual differences above and beyond this shared variance. Uh, and so I'm really interested in um, characterizing those. And the other fun thing about movies is that they lend themselves to a wide variety of different analysis approaches. And I like to think of these on sort of a spectrum from treating the movie as more time-locked or more task-like uh, down to uh, less time-locked or more rest-like analyses. So uh, we could think about extracting features uh, from the movie and using these in sort of classic uh, GLM-based or other uh, families of regression approaches. This would be sort of an encoding model of the stimulus. We can also use things like intersubject correlation and related approaches where we're not necessarily uh, explicitly modeling something about the task, but we're using one subject's brain as a model for another subject's brain to see what's consistent. Uh, and then down here on the other end of the spectrum, because movies are nice continuous tasks, we can also just treat them similar to the way that we treat resting state and do various flavors of functional connectivity analyses as well. Uh, and so some of the questions that I've been interested in are, first of all, which of these approaches or where along this spectrum can we best pull out variants that's related to a behavioral phenotype? Uh, and just a little bit of a spoiler, um, we see I, I've gotten a lot of traction with intersubject correlation approaches, but this poses sort of, an, again, an interesting tension uh, when we try to bring it back to individual differences. So how can we exploit these approaches that fundamentally are picking up on shared variants across people to then come back and say something unique about a given individual? Uh, and just to sort of flesh out these candidate methods a little bit more, so uh, feature-based regressors, this should be uh, very familiar. This is where we're just modeling things in our task, whether it's an event-related model or some more continuous feature that we can pull out, and we're simply looking for voxels or brain regions that track this feature during the movie. The advantage of this approach is that it's time-locked and it's directly interpretable. So we're creating the model, we know exactly what, uh, what we're modeling. Uh, the disadvantage is that we're making a lot of assumptions. We're making assumptions about um, that we know what might be important to model in the first place. We're making an assumption that we can accurately model that. And we're also making assumptions about uh, the nature of the brain data. So for example, usually we have to assume a canonical uh, hemodynamic response function. Uh, Intersubject correlation and related approaches, as I mentioned uh, on the previous slide, again, this is where we're looking at, uh, uh, for let's say a given pair of subjects, if we look at uh, the same brain region in both people, as again, they're watching this time-locked movie, if we see a, a correlation in the activity across people, we can infer that that region is somehow uh, involved in processing the stimulus. And the advantage of intersubject approaches is that they're still exploiting this time-locked na nature. So they're still taking advantage of the fact that subjects are seeing the same thing at the same time, but they're making fewer assumptions about uh, um, our ability to actually model that stimulus itself. The disadvantage is that this is inherently a pairwise measure, and so this makes it a bit harder to model at the single subject level, and I'll come back to that. Uh, and finally, down here on the functional connectivity, there's many ways of doing functional connectivity analysis, but um, generally uh, what these approaches are looking at is uh, uh, correlations between different brain regions. And so the advantage here is that we're capturing potentially uh, interactions or at least correlations between different regions, but the disadvantage is that this tends to be less time-locked, uh, making it a bit harder to interpret. So. Um, the, oh, and the other thing I want to do in this talk, actually, is to plug a few uh, nice uh, public open data sets that have movie watching. And so um, I'll use the first one to sort of test out these different candidate methods. Uh, and this is a data set that comes from the Child Mind Institute in New York uh, called the Healthy Brain Network. They're adding subjects at an incredible rate. <laughs> so um, I'll only show you 68 today. But uh, this is a developmental sample where kids watch this three and a half minute animated film about a boy and a dog. It's cute. It's emotionally evocative in certain places. Uh, and uh, the main phenotype that we were interested in this data set was the social responsiveness scale. 
So this is not necessarily a diagnostic measure, but it does capture sort of a spectrum of variance along um, sort of autism spectrum. The important thing to know about this measure is that higher scores indicate greater impairments in social function. And uh, for purposes of this first set of analysis, we're actually going to um, split this into a, a dichotomized groups, which um, we're going to look, uh, we're going to come back to this and, and find ways to, to treat this as a more continuous variable. Um, but for now, uh, especially with the intersubject correlation approaches, there's some statistical reasons for this. Um, so again, we want to know which of those three potential approaches is going to be most sensitive to differences in SRS score uh, across individuals. And so uh, I'll show you those results here. So the first thing we tried were these uh, regressors where we're actually explicitly modeling something about the stimulus. We modeled things um, from low-level audio-visual features like um, audio RMS and luminance up to things like times when the boy was on screen or the dog was on the screen, all the way up to the presence of an emotional face on the screen. And uh, again, this is a contrast between high SRS children who are poorer in their social function and, and low scores or people or children who are better in their social function. Uh, the grayed out uh, um, contrast didn't show any significance, which um, may be not a terrible thing. So this is a high level measure of social function. And so maybe it makes sense that these children don't necessarily differ in the low level audiovisual pro uh, processing. Uh, there are a few reasons that pop out for some of the other regressors, but overall this was not overwhelming, um, I would say, in its sensitivity to uh, this SRS measure. In our functional connectivity analysis, and again, there's many ways of doing this. Um, for this particular study, we just took a voxel-wise global connectivity approach to try and be uh, as, um, uh, as consistent as possible with the regression-based approach, which is also a voxel-wise measure. Um, and we actually don't see any differences at all that survive correction in functional connectivity during movie watching um, that scale with SRS. On the other hand, when we look at intersubject correlation, we see several regions popping up, and these are all in the direction of uh, these blue regions here are more synchronized in the low SRS scores, which again are the children that have better social function, um, compared to the, the higher, the more impaired uh, kids. And, um, this is an interesting map. You may have recognized some regions here. So we see some social regions perhaps in the temporal lobe as well as medial uh, prefrontal. Um, but basically my, my takeaway from this initial uh, set of analyses is that this guy here, this intersubject correlation, is really showing uh, the greatest sensitivity to this phenotypic difference. And what that tells me is that uh, there is something that's time-locked in the stimulus that's differentiating these children but we're not necessarily capturing it with our encoding models or with these particular regressors that we've chosen to use. So there's some sort of zeitgeist going on as these kids are watching that's, that's, um, that's scaling in some way with this phenotype and the ISC is doing the best job of pulling that out. Uh, okay, but we don't necessarily want to have to dichotomize our subjects into groups. Ideally, we would be able to look at this, treat it as the continuous variable that it is. And so in thinking about how to do this, uh, I've sort of come around to this idea that I think many of us are converging on now, which is this idea of uh, doing, posing this as a representational similarity analysis where our units are the subjects themselves. And so the question here is how can we relate behavior where we're getting one measure per subject to something like intersubject correlation where we're getting one measure per subject pair. Um, of course, those of you that are familiar with RSA um, will see why this is well suited to this problem, but essentially what we want to try and do here is for a given region in the brain, we can look at a brain simil similarity matrix. So this is our intersubject correlation matrix where each row and column is a subject. We're looking at how synchronized that region is during naturalistic viewing uh, in each pair of subjects. And we want to relate that in some way to a behavioral similarity matrix where we're looking at, uh, again, similarity of behavior across these different pairs. Um, and this may seem uh, fairly straightforward on first glance, but it turns out that uh, how we actually model behavioral similarity can have really strong implications for what we end up seeing. Uh, and so, uh, again, in, a, in an RSA, what we're, what we're then going to do is relate the similarity structure between these two things to find regions in the brain that are tracking behavioral similarity as well. Um, but if we, depending on the phenotype we're interested in, we may sort of only have one behavioral score per person. So how do we construct this similarity or this, or this distance matrix, so to speak. And uh, it turns out the way that we do that, we're baking in certain assumptions uh, into our data, and I'll illustrate what I mean by that. So uh, if we think about a brain region here, if we're looking at an intersubject correlation matrix where the subjects are just ordered randomly, we might see some variation such that some pairs of subjects are more strongly um, correlated than others. 
And if we were to take this matrix and actually sort it by uh, the, the behavior that we're interested in, so if we were to rearrange the rows and the columns so that we're moving from low to high on whatever score we're looking at um, across subjects, what, white, what type of structure might we expect to see uh, in this matrix? So we could imagine maybe certain traits or behaviors where after we sort this matrix, um, we might see a structure that looks like this. Uh, so we might see this, this is sort of what I call the, the nearest neighbors framework. So we might see that as we move along the diagonal, subjects that score more similarly to their potential partner uh, are, are more similar in their brain activity as well. And it doesn't really matter where they're scoring on the absolute scale, but it's more about uh, their relative uh, similarity to, to all of the various uh, partners. And so this type of relationship would, of course, be well modeled by Euclidean distance or some other traditional distance, dis, excuse me, distance metric. Um, However, another potential structure that we might see in the data would be something like this. So here, uh, what we might see is that subjects that score uh, high, in this particular example, on this trait, look more similar to other high scorers. But as we move down to the lower end of the spectrum, we see sort of this spreading and variance such that low scorers don't necessarily look similar to one another or to anyone else. Um, and this would not be well captured by a Euclidean distance framework, and I like to call uh, this type of potential structure the Anna Karenina structure, because basically uh, what it's telling us is that all high scores are alike, where all low scores are low scoring in their own way. Um, and of course, we could maybe flip high and low depending on the, the behavior that we're interested in. And just to, to give you an example of the, potentially one of these Anna Karenina traits, uh, this comes from a, a small study that we ran in the lab a couple years ago now where we, were, uh, we had subjects on a range of trait paranoia scores listen to a narrative that was designed to be deliberately ambiguous, such that some people would find it very suspicious and other people would find it less, less so. And we identified several regions in a whole brain analysis using intersubject correlation that were more synchronized in uh, pairs of high paranoia people than pairs of low. Um, the first of these regions was the left temporal pole. So I'm showing you the region as well as some of the top neurosynth hits for that region. And if we actually just plot out our intersubject correlation matrix, you can even start to eyeball this structure here. So you can see that uh, pairs of high paranoia people are synchronized with one another, uh, but not necessarily um, with the, the low paranoia participants. Um, and this was well controlled for many other trait and, and cognitive variables. And another region that showed uh, a significant structure to this effect was the right medial PFC. Uh, so paranoia may be a case where, um, again, it's best modeled by sort of this anacrenin or this sort of variance um, constriction or spreading depending on which end of the uh, phenotypic spectrum we're at. And I'll show you uh, just uh, lastly, um, uh, the second open source data set that I would like to plug is the Human Connectome Project. A little known fact, they actually do have naturalistic viewing in this data set. Um, it's the seven Tesla data, so it's a subset of the subjects that were scanned at 3T. Uh, here are the data specs here. And uh, in this case, what we're doing, we, we started with uh, 89 subjects from this data set that were unrelated to one another, and we're looking at uh, about a 15-minute movie watching run. So they see a series of different video clips, um, but crucially, every subject sees the same clips in the same order. And we're now going to look at this using a 268 node atlas. So basically, for every node, we're modeling uh, brain similarity and behavioral similarity on a few different traits um, and seeing which nodes uh, show the same type of represent, uh, representational similarity structure as certain behaviors. And just to prove to you that the way that we're doing this model really matters, uh, I'll show you some examples from, uh, from this data set, the HCP data set. So, here we're trying both of our potential RSA models, so the nearest neighbor model as well as the Anna Karenina model. And if we do this for something like personality, so all of these subjects completed the five-factor inventory outside of the scanner. And so if we model personality as sort of a nearest neighbor uh, trait in the sense that uh, if we just compute the uh, distance between two subjects item-wise responses and we use that as our measure of behavioral similarity and we relate that to brain similarity in each of our 268 nodes, you can see we get uh, several nodes popping out that show uh, similar representational structure between the brain and the behavior. And again, this is not saying anything about where people actually fall on the big five traits. It's just how similarly they tend to fill in this questionnaire. Uh, these are the areas of the brain that, that tend to uh, look similar during naturalistic viewing. Uh, and it's a negative relationship because it's a distance. So lower distance means higher uh, ISC. 
Interestingly, if we were to model uh, any of the big five traits, so any of the, the subscores on things like agreeableness, extroversion, et cetera, if we were to model those as these Anna Karenina type relationships, we don't see anything at all. So we don't observe any brain nodes, for example, that are more synchronized among people that are more agreeable or less agreeable. Uh, However, if we turn to this behavioral measure, so this is um, another measure that we tried, which was reaction time and an emotion recognition task, so perhaps indexing uh, some measure of social processing. If we model this as a nearest neighbor similarity problem, we don't see any nodes that show a significant relationship. Uh, however, if we model this in the Anna Karenina framework, uh, specifically this time looking at uh, subjects that score uh, sorry, that um, have faster reaction times. So these are the, the nodes in which uh, two subjects that both have fast reaction times will look more similar, uh, whereas subjects with slower reaction times are looking more different both from one another and from the fast responders. And so you can see that a lot of the brain now pops out uh, as showing a significant representational similarity. So uh, we're really interested in diving into this further. There's a lot of questions that we can ask with this, uh, but I think this is an interesting uh, preliminary set of results showing us that we can get some traction on these individual differences using things like movies that, uh, again, they may not be purely naturalistic, but they preserve a lot of context. Uh, they have really interesting temporal dynamics. Um, we're looking forward to exploring this further. So just to sum up, uh, movie watching evokes a lot of similarity across people, but it also evokes meaningful individual differences. Uh, at least in our hands, these time-locked analysis approaches seem to be doing the best for capturing uh, phenotypic variants. Uh, and finally, uh, if, um, as we sort of converge on these types of intersubject representational similarity approaches, I think it's really important to consider um, the theory behind how we're modeling similarity and what we think, um, how we think various traits might be represented uh, in the brain. And so with that, I would like to thank um, my collaborators back at NAMH, as well as the open data sets. Um, and put in a shameless plug for a, a special issue of NeuroImage that I'm guest editing on naturalistic imaging. So if you have papers, send them our way. And thanks for your attention.